So, have you ever baked a cake? Anybody baked a cake? Now, I'm not talking about one of these. All right, because anybody can do one of these, right? Like, this is simple. You add this to the bowl, add two thirds cup of vegetable oil, three eggs, whip it up, put it in the oven, bake it, mind you, at 350 degrees for, depending upon what size you use, anywhere from about 20 minutes for cupcakes to about 40 minutes, 45 minutes for a bundt cake. So many of us, we've, we've made one of these, right? These are relatively simple. Now in my house, Saturday mornings when we have time, depending upon what's going on in the life of the Tabone house, uh, I am a big fan of this. Anybody know what this is? Pancake. This is pancake mix. This is my favorite pancake mix because you add this in water, you whip it up, and you're done. It doesn't require any of this or any of this or any eggs. I didn't want to bring any eggs out. They're kind of expensive right now, so I was like, I'm not going to waste any eggs. At, at first, I was going to just make this big mess, right? And then I could just imagine people being like, no, where's the dust buster? Like, just pump your brakes, Pastor. You don't need to make a mess to make a point. But again, let me go back. How many of us have made a cake before? Old-fashioned way, you, you, you take flour, and, and when you take flour, you need a certain amount of flour, right? You, you have to measure it out right. The thing about baking is about precision. When you bake something, you need the right amounts entered in at the right order, and then it needs to be mixed together appropriately, and then placed into the oven, baked at a right temperature for a right amount of time in order that what you have baked turns out just right. What happens when you attempt to bake something and you don't follow directions? You don't follow the order. You start with adding the wrong amount of the wrong thing in the wrong order. You don't get what you set out to make. It doesn't matter for some of us how well we try, if we don't add it in the right amount in the right order at the right time, we don't get the right product, right? There's something to be said about the precision of entering in the right ingredients in the right order at the right temperature for the right time. And there's something to be said about when it all goes wrong, when we enter the wrong ingredients in the wrong order at the wrong temperature for the wrong time. So what's the problem? For you and I, as we think about this, the problem lies in priority. Think about it. How many of us, when looking at our life, we are working with the right ingredients? We've got God, we've got family, we've got friends, we've got vocation, vacation, we've got uh, ministry, we've got money, we've got all the right ingredients, but for some of us, we're adding them in in the wrong order. For some of us, we're adding a whole lot of time and investment on leisure, maybe a whole lot of time and investment on comfort. Maybe for others of us, we're adding a whole lot of time and energy and priority to things like work or family or friends or sports or, or this or that or television or whatever the case may be for some of us, we're working with the right ingredients, but we're adding the wrong amount in the wrong order. Am I, am I talking to anybody this morning? Anybody understand where we're coming from? You see, this morning, we're going to be wrestling with the idea of priority. Because let's be honest, church family, when it comes to our priorities, for some of us, we don't always start and end with God. When it comes to some of our priorities, the first thing that we think about in the morning becomes the most important thing we think about all day. And for some of us, it's not God. 
Others of us, we are on the grind, on the hustle to make a life for ourselves. We're still young and still finding ourselves. For others of us, we're in the middle of a career and we're still grinding. Or For others of us, we've retired and, and we're trying to relax. We've done grind. But again, when we get up in the morning and we begin to set our mind and set our heart and set our affections on the things for the day, how many of us begin with, center on, end with God? I think there's some of us this morning who walked in who are, again, working with the right ingredients. We've got work, we've got family, we've got sports, we've got leisure, we've got family and friends and church and God all in the mix. But some of us are adding them in in the wrong order. So this morning, I want us to wrestle with it. I want us to look at it. Because there is a mandate that we hear in the text that we're going to look at this morning about how you and I are called We are mandated to live as kingdom-minded individuals, to live as gospel-oriented citizens. So let's pray over our time this morning, and then let's jump in to the message. Heavenly Father, this morning, as we have come to worship you, it is my prayer, Lord, that you would give each and every one of us the eyes to see ears to hear, and hearts to receive the word that you have for each of us today. Father, show up to us in a real and tangible way. Show up, Lord, and show off to remind us of just how good you are. So Jesus, we pray these things in your name, trusting and believing that you are with us. So Lord, be with us, for it's in your name we pray. Amen. So church, we, we have a problem. It's a problem of prioritizing our life. So what can we do about it? Well, this morning as we continue through Philippians, we hear from the Apostle Paul about some of the things that will help us keep our mind in order so that we can prioritize our life right. We're going to start in Philippians chapter 1, and if you have a Bible, I'm going to encourage you to open and follow along. Maybe it's a paper one like this. Maybe it's a digital one. If not, it is okay. The words will be on the screen, but we're going to start in verse 18b, uh, where it says, yes, I will rejoice, and we're going to go through 30. So hear the word of the Lord this morning. Yes! And I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and your help, through the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this, my current affliction, will turn out for my deliverance. And it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, and to die, well, that is gain. For I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which I shall choose I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and for your joy in the faith. So that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. Uh, did you hear that? Let me, let me say that again. That's important. Only let your life be worthy of the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ. So that whether I come to you or see you and, or I am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. 
This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had and now hear that I still have. And may God bless the reading of his word. This particular section from the Apostle Paul breaks down into three smaller parts. Paul affirms that no matter what happens during his trial, now remember Paul is in prison waiting to go on trial in Rome because he had been preaching the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ to people that were around him and folks did not like this message in a predominantly secular or, or um, you know, anti-Christian culture to get up and preach this message for Paul put him in prison. It was dangerous. Now, that's not at all the case today, right? No, there are still people today who, if preaching the gospel in certain parts of the world will result in their imprisonment. We know this in places like China where you cannot own a Bible. And missionaries who smug Bible, smuggle Bibles into China, if they get caught, they get arrested and put on trial. The same is similar in parts of Africa and parts of the Middle East that are predominantly Islamic cultures, where it is against their will and their ways to have the gospel of Jesus Christ proclaimed, there are still to this day men and women who are suffering for the cause of the gospel of Christ. So Paul affirms that no matter what's happening to him in his trial, his ultimate joy in Jesus Christ will not be diminished. For some of us, we've been talking about this idea that whether we are suffering in hardship or we are living through good circumstances, that we should have joy in the midst of our life. So for his context, what he is saying is that he will be confident of the fact that he will be saved and that Christ will be exalted through him. This is the first part of this paragraph from Paul. The second part is that Paul is confident in Christ, that he does find confidence as he reflects on two potential outcomes for his situation. Either he will live or he will die. But no matter what happens to Paul in the midst of his trials, in the midst of his suffering, in the midst of his context, he is confident that whether he dies or lives, it's for gain. For Paul, the gain is that if he dies in the flesh, he goes to live on in eternity from that moment on with Jesus Christ. So for Paul, there is gain. It's not gain that he gives up on all that's going on, but that he is reunited with his Savior, the one who saves his soul and loves him dearly. That's that's gain for Paul. But he says, if I live, it's also gain for you because I get to engage with you, the Philippians, and I get to show you the love of Christ, and I get to be an example of the love of God, and we get to enjoy this fellowship together with one another. So whether I live or I die, it's good either for me or for you, but ultimately it's good for all of us. So he's talking about to live is Christ, to die is gain. To Paul, there's advantages in both. And lastly, Paul is fully expectant that he will be released from imprisonment and go to visit the Philippians real soon. And in the midst of this, Paul desires to add to their faith. Could you imagine finding yourself imprisoned, locked up, suffering for the cause of God, sitting there being told this might not end well and yet living with the bold audacious confidence that god would see you through from prison to freedom that's the kind of confidence paul is is working with this is the kind of confidence that paul is living with and in the end he's ultimately vindicated in this moment and he is 
freed to preach to them some more, right? Or no? Doesn't he wind up being martyred eventually? He might have been freed after this was written, but he was imprisoned again. And he eventually was martyred. You see, Paul is writing to us and setting an example for us, just as he was for the Philippians then, for us today, of what priorities look like. You see, the first thing we need to understand this morning is that Paul reminds us that our first priority is to God. For Paul, Christ is the ultimate source of joy. And Christ is the reason why Paul rejoices. He understands that in the midst of his prison, he has the ability to rejoice and find joy because he knows that Christ is with him, that Christ is in him, that Christ is the reason that all this is going on. But ultimately, Paul has the assurance that no matter what happens to him, God can and will use it to bring about good, either in Paul's life personally or the Philippians. He can rejoice because he knows that no matter what happens, good will be brought out of it. Let's reflect on our own lives for just a moment. How would our attitudes, our demeanors change if we began to view every situation and circumstance as an opportunity for God to bring good through it? Paul writes in Romans that he was assured of this, that God would bring about a good work knowing that God is working out all things for the good of those who love God and are called according to his plans and purposes. That doesn't mean that God is going to remove pain, remove suffering. It means that God will work in and through it to bring about something good, whether in our life or the life of those around us. Would our attitudes, would our demeanors change if we knew that in every circumstance or situation in every trial or tribulation, God was working things out for our good. Might not be the end results that we want, amen? But it's still going to be ultimately down the line, down the road for our good in some way, shape, or form. Paul says to live as Christ, to die as gain. Paul is able to say this Paul is able to proclaim this. Paul is able to live this way with Christ as his number one priority because Paul has confessed Christ as his Lord and Savior. Church, have we ever thought about what it actually means to place Jesus first in our life, to place Jesus amongst our life, to end with Jesus? Do we understand what it means to be fully reliant on Jesus? Well, it means that we have a personal relationship with God. It means that we wake up in the morning and we give thanks to God. We live our lives in such a way that Christ is in the midst of our whole life. He is not just first and last, but he is amongst all things. But it also means that we have taken the time to recognize what, what many scholars, many theologians, many pastors would call this, this Roman roads of Paul. You see, Paul wrote, to the church in Rome what it looks like to be a Christian. It starts with the recognition in Romans 3.10 that there is no person alive who is righteous. That as we look around, we see that the world around us is a world that's filled with unrighteousness. Amen? We don't have to look very far. Turn on any of your favorite news channels. Pick one. doesn't matter which side you will see that there is injustice in this world. There's no one who is righteous. And we know that this unrighteousness stems from the fact that we are born, we believe, with a sinner's nature. Now, whether we are born with sin or born into sin, I'm not going to argue about that, but it doesn't take very much for us to recognize that as our kids get to get a little bit older, there's something wrong within them, right? Right? I've got two little girls who um, I call my own, and I love them dearly, but there was never a time in my life that I taught them that fighting was appropriate, but yet that's all they do. They fight, they bicker, they pick on, right? Anybody else have a sibling and live that kind of lifestyle where you were never taught to treat them 
with, with disdain, but someday you woke up and you were like, I don't like them anymore. And it's just downhill. There is no one who is righteous, and we see that even from the littlest to the oldest. And I'm not saying that there's something terrible about my children, there's something inherently wrong. I'm not saying that. My children, just as each and every one of us, were born, we were made in the image and likeness of God. We are God's creation, and He is compassionate and kind towards us. He loves us. But we live in a world that is broken. Paul goes on in Romans 3, verse 23, to say that all have fallen short of the glory of God. So there's none that are righteous for all sin and fall short of the glory of God. And he goes on in 6.23 to say that because there is sin, the wages of sin is death. Sin is what separates us from God. Sin is the ultimate problem. Sin is the thing that needs to be dealt with in our life and in our world. We need a Savior from our sin. We need a Savior for the world. Amen? There is no one who is righteous for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. But yet, Romans 5 a. but yet while we were still sinners, God sends Christ and Christ dies for us. Not when we were righteous, not when we worked it all out, not when we got our act together, not when things were good, but yet while we were still sinners, Christ comes and he dies for us. So Paul says that if we, in Romans 10, 9 and 10, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and we believe in our hearts that God has raised him from the dead, then we will be saved because Romans 10, 13, for all who confess the name of Christ will find salvation. Romans 5, 1, when we have salvation, the peace of Christ is with us because we have been justified by God. And therefore, as Romans 8, 1 says, There is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ. We we call this the Roman roads, that we walk from unrighteousness to righteousness. We walk from far from God to close to God, all because Jesus shows up and shows off on our behalf. And this is the reality for you and I, that when we prioritize Jesus, we recognize that he is the Savior of our life that we confess Him as Lord, that we live our life in such a way that He is at the beginning, He is in the midst of it all, and He is at the end. So let's go back to our cake analogy. If I were to make a cake this morning, and I was to have the entire cake here, and I was beginning to divide it up, there's a couple of us here this morning, two, four, six, a whole lot more than I have cake for, amen? But if I was to divide it up and to give each and every one of you a slice, the slivers are going to be a little small, right? But what happens if I start with my wife and children, and and then I go to Miss Pat, and and I go back to Todd, and and then over there to Jim in the tech booth, and over here to Lynn, and I I, I just start to hand cake out. Eventually, I'm going to what? I'm going to run out of cake, right? What happens if my starting point was all of y'all, and I was hoping that I would have just enough left over from, for God. Because I was like, oh man, Jesus showed up. I need to get Jesus a piece of cake. If I start with all of the other things and leave Jesus to the end, I'll never have enough left over. But what happens if I start with Jesus and I make him the number one priority and he gets the first little slice of cake? There's always going to be enough left over for you and I. Amen? See, it's about that that switch of perspective. To start with Jesus is to recognize Him as Lord and Savior in our life, but it also is to start with Him, to have Him in the midst of everything, and to end with Him. He is our number one priority. So Paul here, he paints this clear picture that to prioritize Christ is to have the courage to honor God with all of our spirit, mind, and body. As Jesus said in Luke 27, to love God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength. So Paul is telling us to prioritize Jesus is to love God with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength. So like, look at Paul's attitude. 
Whether he lives or dies, it's all for Christ. If he lives, he honors God. If he dies, he honors God. Paul's life reflects what it looks like to honor Jesus Christ. But Paul doesn't start and end there. He, he goes on like Jesus does in that verse from Luke, and he says, your second priority is to one another. Your second priority is to others. Inherent in this verse in, in the Greek, and it doesn't translate very well into the English, but in the Greek is this idea of friendship. When Paul talks about the others in this passage of Scripture, in this paragraph, he's talking about what friendship looks like. So, real quick, take a moment, look around the church. All right, would you wave at somebody in here who's a friend? Paul talks about our first priority is to Christ. Our second priority is to one another. For we are friends together in this. Paul recognizes that to remain in his body is necessary for his audience. While departing and being with Christ might, might be better for Paul, staying and serving in fruitful labor for, for Christ is better for the Philippians. In Paul's phrase, to live is Christ, to die is gain, Paul models what it means to put in the interest of others above his own. Later on, as we get further into Philippians, we'll hear again that echo to love others above ourselves, to treat others, their interests, their likes, their dislikes as being on par with or better than our own. In this, Paul is simply reenacting the self-giving love of Jesus Christ. Church family, to genuinely embrace the words of to live is Christ, there needs to be a radical shift in our focus away from ourselves and towards others. We do this by connecting with others, loving others, praying for others, serving others, hosting others, and genuinely enjoying one another. Amen? That last one may be tough, but I think we can do it. We're to be an example of Jesus Christ to others by encouraging them in their faith. See, we all have priorities in life. In my life, my priorities go God, family, and my family one is broken up into a few different parts. It's wife, then children, then extended, then friends. After family, it's church and church family. I'm a member and a worshiper of God first. And my fourth priority is vocation. I worship as a member before I lead as a pastor. And when I get those mixed up, God help us all because we're out of whack. God, family, church, vocation, everything else. So you were handed an index card when you came in this morning. Hopefully you have a pen or there's a writing utensil around you. What are your priorities in life? What are your top one, two, three, four priorities in life? All of us have a refrigerator, right? I would hope, or something that maybe we could go home and stick this to. Now, while as your pastor, I would tell you that your first priority should be to God, as you reflect on your life, you might realize that your first priority is not to God right now. Your first priority might be to something else. So on one side of this card, I want you to do this. I want you to write down what your priorities actually look like. And on the other side, I want you to write down what your priorities should look like. And when you get home, take that side of what it actually does look like and flip it over and stick it to the fridge of what it should look like. Remind yourself every day, these are what my priorities should look like. I should start with God. I should then start with family. And I should then move to vocation. And then I should move to vacation. And then I should move to so on and so forth. Your priorities may look different than your spouses, your children, your neighbors. But can we agree on this? Can we agree on this? 
If Paul was right in his preaching, our first priority should be to God. Our second priority should be to others. And everything else should come after that. Your everything else, church, I hope looks different. But we should start with God. We should move to others. And everything else should follow after that. Now, why? Pastor, all right, that's great and all, but why? I'm a busy man. I'm a busy woman. I've I'm, 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 I got a complicated career. I, you know, why should I live like that? Why should I prioritize God? Simply this, two things. First, because you've been called to live a life that is worthy of the gospel. You are called to live a life worthy of the gospel. And you do this by standing firm in the Holy Spirit, striving together with one another, and being courageous and living without fear. You're called to be a kingdom-minded citizen. That is the mandate that God has for your life. So you need to prioritize your time by standing firm in the Holy Spirit, striving together side by side with one another, and being strong and courageous and living without fear. Because that is who God is calling you to be. So join me as we conclude in a word of prayer. Father, as we reflect on our life and we think about our priorities, we hear from your servant Paul this morning that the number one priority of our life should be placing you first within it. That doesn't mean that we wake up in the morning and we give you five minutes and we say, hey, we gave God our first and then we move on into something else. But God, to place you first means to place you in the midst of everything. That it's not like cutting up a piece of cake and giving you a sliver, God. It's more like the bike spoke. That you are the central hub that touches every little aspect of our life that is the wheel. That there is nowhere in our life that you should be hidden from. So God, remind us of what our priorities should be starting with, dwelling upon, and ending with you. And that from there we take serious Jesus' great commandment to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself. So God, today, remind us of what our priorities should be. Help us to place them in a place where we see them daily and are reminded that when we get out of order, God, it's okay. There is grace. There is peace. There is forgiveness. And there's a new day. The end of everyone tomorrow. And that if we today, there's hope tomorrow. It's you above all things as we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.